the 308 Winchester versus the 30-06. This is the 30 caliber battle you have been waiting for, and we're going to take it on today. Hello, friends and lovers. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Ammunition Guide podcast, brought to you by none other than Ammo.com. Chris, today we're going to compare two cartridges that can actually be compared to each other. Oh, no yeah. apples and oranges kind of talk today. We're doing the 308 versus the 30 6 Yeah, Dave, you're absolutely right. This is probably one of the biggest debates in the hunting community right now, uh, and it has been for years, ever since the 308 came out. But before we dive into it, I want to encourage everybody go down to the link in the pinned description or uh, the pinned comment, rather, and also in the description of the video and go ahead and click on that link. Get your free $20 off coupon of your next order on ammo.com. I mean, if you're going to buy the ammo, you might as well save some, especially on something like 30 out 6 or 308. And uh, yeah, these are probably two of the biggest 30 caliber war horses that we have had here in the United States. The history behind both of these cartridges is extensive, to say the least. Yeah, and that right there is why it's so heavily favored as a rule. Anything the Army used is going to be... Uh preferred among American civilians, anyone who became familiar with it during their service. Absolutely. And I think that's kind of the really the the big aspect of it. It's like, you know, you you go in and, you know, say you, you served, you know, in World War One or even in World War Two, you're so used to carrying that 30 out six and shooting it either with the 1903 Springfield or the M1 Garand that it just is second nature to you uh, at that yeah. point. And it saw ridiculously good commercial success here in the States as a hunting cartridge. Yeah, I mean, I imagine the, the mountains of surplus brass that must have oh, been available yeah. after the war probably encouraged a lot of a lot of hand loaders, and I know wildcatters love the thirty odd six. Oh, definitely. There were several cases that uh, you know were birthed from the thirty odd six for sure, and uh, I mean, you can still get that surplus ammunition. They still made so much of it. You can still find that uh, Greek, uh, I believe it's HXP uh, surplus thirty odd six. Uh, is still yes, on the market. We have sold it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, it's the amount uh, that's out there is just astronomical, and it only comes close to you know the the two two three Remington, and of course the three oh eight, uh, which is still in service today. That uh, kind of came in to replace the thirty out six after you know Korea. And the reason that they uh, introduced the three oh eight, they they designed it smaller, right? So it was more <laughs> logistically for want of a better word, cool to transport ammo that way? Well, obviously, we have to have the cool factor. Otherwise, it's just not worth it. Uh, but yeah, really what it comes down to is it comes down to weight is a huge one. And, you know, as good as the 30-06 is, it was an antiquated design. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not effective. Uh, don't confuse old with ineffective because it, those two do not necessarily walk hand in hand. Uh, because, I mean, the 30-06 is still used for hunting today. Uh, but, you know, the military wanted something new. They had the Russians making the 762 by 39 and the AK-47, and they're like, we need to up our game. Uh, and what they came up with was the 308 and, of course, the M14, uh, or the civilian version being the M1A. And uh, they were able to basically, with modern cartridge design, chop off about, uh, let me think here. So it's the 308 is 762 by 51. And the 30 out 6 is 762 by 63. So that would be uh, on stream math 12 millimeters of case length and basically had the same uh, internal and external ballistics. They did that solely with uh, <clears throat> more efficient propellant, right? That's correct. Uh, you know, the the technology never stands still. We're always moving forward and, you know, developing new things. And the modern propellants that they had in the day uh, really let the 308 do exactly what they wanted to do and transition from a long action to a short action, which was something that they wanted because that short action is preferred, especially in fully automatic fire. Yeah, you were telling me it doesn't make a night and day difference when you're just operating a bolt. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, and you're like, well, you know, you can get faster follow-up shots with a short action. And I suppose if, you know, you really timed it out, you could maybe shave a half a second off your, your bolt 
you know, reciprocation time. But in truth, it's not going to be a huge difference. And, you know, for most civilian shooters, especially hunters, uh, you're going to take one shot and that's it. So the length of the action doesn't really play a huge role uh, in the civilian term. But the argument can be made that also it's lighter. And I think that's kind of the big thing. Not only is the the bullet itself, the cartridge itself lighter because the 308 is shorter, but also the action will be a little bit lighter. So it'll be easier to carry through the woods. Yeah, it's often overlooked, especially, you know, most firearms are, are sold for tactical applications now. Oh, yeah. But uh, lugging a big, heavy piece of steel and wood through the, through the woods it stinks. Yeah, you don't see people hauling a Barrett MRAD around. I'll tell you that much. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I think that's about a 14 pound rifle, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's great for, you know, shooting something, you know, from a, a sandbag position, but carrying it through the woods all day on a stock on, you know, maybe you're going after elk or mule deer or something like that. You really want to have a lightweight, compact, easy to handle rifle and having that little less weight on there, you know, as backpackers will say, ounces equal pounds. And it really can make a difference on a long day's hike. Well, I think the Barrett, I think that's a 30 pounder. I got to look that up. It's a lot of gun, no matter how you slice it. Well, I think you're talking about the, the 50 BMG version. The one I'm talking about is the Barrett MRAD, which is their, uh, their bolt action. Uh, that yeah. you can get, and that's more like for the 338 Lapua, which we talked about uh, a couple episodes ago. Well, I regret to inform the audience that the B key on my laptop is broken. Uh -oh. So I can't I can't look it up, but I can't tell you that Eret means stop in French. Oh well, that's good to know. All right, uh, that's good to Take know. Take notes at home, folks. Exactly. The things you learn when you watch the whole video—that's the important thing to gather from this right now. Yeah, I'll just read the uh, description and start flame wars in the comments. Take or notes. do we love comments? Please make sure you put down your comments down below. It helps. Uh, it really does. Everything you do. That's true. And if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate freedom. Exactly. So if you love freedom and you love getting ammo for cheap, make sure you click that like and subscribe button. You'll be doing yourself a favor. All right. So awesome. So, you know, I think the, the big thing here, uh, one of the big takeaways, obviously, is, uh, you know, the 30 on six still very potent on game. And I think one of the big benefits that it still has today is it can fire slightly heavier bullets than the 308. Uh, with that long action, uh, it gives you a little more leeway uh, as far as, you know, the, the weights of bullets that you can fire. A 30 out 6 can shoot up to a 220 grain bullet, where 308 is pretty much capped off right around 300 grains, or excuse me, 200 grains. Hmm. So the extra 20 grains, that's going to give you appreciably better accuracy, I would reckon, at very long distances that I would probably never try to cover. Oh, definitely. Uh, and yeah, you and I are both, you know, more than happy to admit that uh, we are not uh, snipers by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Neither have we been trained to be such. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that ex little extra weight uh, can give you a little bit extra ballistic coefficient, which can definitely help when you're shooting long range, but it also adds some more kinetic energy for all of my elk hunters out there uh, when you really want to get, you know, as much power and as much kinetic energy into that game animal. 220 is going to be a bit better uh, fired from a 30 out 6. Now, aside from these uh, disparate bullet weights, I would imagine the Army didn't develop a radically different cartridge in terms of uh, ballistic performance. And I do understand that 30 out 6 and 308 are generally considered pretty much the same effective range. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they can definitely reach out there. I think with military, I believe the military caps it right around seven to 800 yards, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, for the effective range for both of these. Now, uh, I think one of the main reasons for the switch was because they kind of came to understand that battles were not going to be fought at that distance anymore. Uh, you know, the long gone were the days of trench warfare where you were taking, you know, like these two, three, four hundred yard shots across no man's land uh, like they were doing in World War I. Uh, instead, it was, you know, like urban combat like they saw in France, um, you know, landing on the beaches in Normandy, uh, even in Korea, uh, you know, the shots were not as long. This may be a dopey question, but what, what, what was it like airplanes that kind of ended trench warfare? Uh, that and tanks, if you ask me, 
Uh, I think yeah. that I mean, the they had tanks... both of those in the first world war, but I guess they made them better by world war two. Oh, definitely. And I think that just the fact that armies were more mobile, uh, you saw, you know, the, the Germans with the blitzkrieg, uh, were able to basically go around any type of entrenched warfare. I mean, you look at the Maginot line, uh, that was rendered completely useless by, you know, the dude with the mustache going around the back door. All right. So basically, as as warfare became a little more up close and personal and a little more intimate, that that bred the need. But but three oh eight and forty out six, these are still still practical in combat. I mean, at least the three oh eight, which we still use. Oh, absolutely no. The three oh eight is still in service. Uh, you know, with the United States military, uh, you look at the M two forty Bravo as our you know our uh, squad serviced automatic weapon that, uh, you know, they carry around, replace the M60, uh, which all of our Vietnam veterans were members as the pig, uh, is still used in, you know, miniguns and even the snipers are still using it though, being more replaced by the 300 Win Mag now, uh, the 308 still seeing a lot of use in the military. 30 out six, not so much anymore. Uh, it's pretty much been retired. Uh, it had quite the long military service from, you know, World War One all the way up and in, even into parts of Vietnam. Uh, the the out six was still being used, and uh, you know, after a long service like that, I think it deserves a good retirement in the woods just to go deer hunting. Uh, but yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. don't the Marines still use thirty out six rifles during their ceremonies? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're still carrying around their their garands still, for their still drills. Technically, still technically in service in in the least active way possible. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, they do have their M1 garands for their their drill rifles, uh, but uh, for the most part. Uh, the, as far as issue ammo, uh, you're only going to see the, the 308 currently in the military. But like you said earlier, that just means that there's a ton of components out there, especially if you like to reload like I do. And the beautiful part about both of these is they fire the same diameter bullet, which is a huge advantage because you can just stockpile the same bullets for both cartridges. Totally interchangeable like that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, like I said, the, the 220 grain is really just relegated to the 30 out six, but uh, pretty much anything else in between, you can load for both of them. Well, I got to ask if you tried to jam a 220 grain bullet into a 308, what would happen? Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it deep enough. Uh, with a powder charge that would make it effective. Uh, I need to look. It's been a hot minute since I've reloaded really heavy uh, 308 rounds, like over 200 grains. Uh, I feel my gut tells me there are a couple of companies that are doing it, but I don't think you're going to get the ballistic performance that you want as you would out of a 30 out six. And part of that is because the the uh, the case capacity, the uh, the case capacity of 30 out six is listed right around at 68 grains, where the 308 is 56. Uh, so when you're shooting something heavier like that, having a little bit extra powder in there really helps push it out the barrel faster. Huh. So maybe theoretically a, a very specialized subsonic load in 308 could could possibly have a 220 grain bullet. But... Yeah, I think that that's fair. Uh, again, I'd need to double check, but uh, yeah, you could definitely probably do that. Uh, it just wouldn't be really effective for hunting. Honestly, subsonic rounds typically don't have enough kinetic energy to get reliable expansion, uh, which mm. is why uh, it's usually recommended that you not hunt with rounds that aren't going supersonic speeds. Interesting. So I guess the, the main reason you'd want to favor the 308 over the 30 odd six would be so you can you can utilize those more modern rifles, especially combat rifles. Doesn't sound like there's many semi-auto 30 odd six rifles out there. Well, I mean, pretty much the the M1 Garand is what you're limited to for the most part. Now, I do know that there are some. Uh, I believe the the Browning BAR you can get in a 30 out six, and that's a more modern rifle, but it has the more classic look to it. Uh, the mm -hmm. the wood the wood and the metal look. But yeah, for the most part, for 30 out six, you're mostly relegated to bolt action rifles if you're looking to get something a little more modern. Whereas with the 308, you get an M1A, uh, you can get an AR10. There are AKs that are chambered in 308. Uh, there's lots of different options. You get FAL, uh, you know, the, uh, what is it? The, the Keltec RFB, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is, yeah. is also in 308. So lots of semi-automatic options for 308. Um, needless to say, either of these are capable of handling a threat. It's kind of the whole reason they exist. Oh, yeah. Uh, naturally, home defense with either of these, you're going to have to check your... Uh, 
you, you're probably going to have to go to your ear doctor afterward. Oh, gosh, yes. I can't even imagine how loud it would be cracking one of these off inside. I hope you've got your ear pro next to your self-defense uh, rifle if that's the case. But honestly, I would be more concerned with overpenetration firing one of these in the home, uh, especially where I live in like the suburbs. That's that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Uh, the last thing I want to do is have something penetrate through my wall and into my neighbor's wall. That That's a good way to uh, lose your shirt in court. Yeah. What's your saying about bullets and lawyers? Yeah, every bullet you fire has got a lawyer attached to it. I assume overpenetration would be a huge advantage in combat, though. you got to assume whoever's standing behind the guy you're aiming at isn't on your side either. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's really the difference between home defense and combat and something that we have to consider uh, as, you know, responsible armed citizens that we need to make sure that we know exactly what our backstop is. We have to follow the four rules of shooting safety. And, you know, in a self-defense situation, unless you live in the country where your next you know, neighbor isn't, you know, a good 20 acres away, um, probably it's going to be a bit much uh, for self-defense. Now, of course, remember, overkill is underrated, but uh, still, I can't really recommend either of these for self-defense if you live in an urban or suburban setting. Yeah, or even an AR-15 would probably be a little much. It, it is. You, you're going to want to have some specialized ammunition. You either want some soft points or maybe even some frangible ammo uh, if you're going to utilize an AR-15 inside the home. Now, let's talk about the, the variety of ammo available for these two. Because oh, I know yeah. 308, you can get anything. Yep. For 30 out 6 I'm sure every manufacturer has a few good hunting options. Oh, but more. When it comes to, yeah. yeah, when it comes to like... Uh, just regular everyday humdrum ball ammo. Can you can you get thirty odd six FMJs as easily as three oh eights? Absolutely. I mean, maybe not as much as you used to be able to. I know that the CMP is running a little low on ammunition, uh, but like we were talking about earlier, there's still surplus three oh eight running around. Uh, now, if you're on any of the 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 M one Garand groups, uh, whether you be on you know. Facebook or any other online forum, the the going joke is like, is it safe to fire in my M1 Garand, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, Federal makes uh, an American Eagle that is specifically tuned for the M1 Garand gas system. And the reason for that is, is because modern powders, like we talked about earlier with the, you know, the 308 basically being ballistically equivalent to the 30-06, if you put those modern powders in you know, an older 30 out six rifle, it's just not ready to handle that type of pressure. Yeah. People ask this all the time mm -hmm. and it breaks my heart because I know some modern commercial loaded 30 out six would probably work okay in an M1, but as a matter of uh, principle, I refuse to recommend ammo that isn't specifically loaded to the M1 specs. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that. And the last thing you want to do is have somebody come back and, you know, complain that they bent their op rod or something like that. And oh. That's that's a quite a an expensive repair and the last thing yeah. you want. So if you do have an M1 Garand, make sure that any ammo that you buy uh, is specifically rated for an M1 Garand. Yeah, like you say, Federal loads it, but uh, Privy Partisan makes it mm -hmm. too in Serbia. Yep. Seller and Bellet, I've seen theirs come out of the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. So there's a few a few good options, but uh, man, you really don't ever want to damage any firearm, but you yeah. really don't want to damage an M1 Garand. Definitely. I mean, it's it's America's rifle. Uh, it is, as, as General Patton said, the, the greatest battle implement ever made. And, you know, it really is an iconic piece of American history. And yeah, the last thing you want to do is damage that thing. Yeah, then then you really hate freedom and probably oh, should definitely. subscribe. You know, it's interesting. I, I purchased an M1 Grand just about a year ago. Uh, and uh, it was funny because I got myself some surplus ammo, right? I knew I, I checked the head stamp, so it, I knew it was going to be pressurized appropriately. Uh, and uh, the rifle had not been serviced for quite some time. Uh, put in the first mag. Uh, by the fourth round, my recoil spring had shattered because it was so brittle. Oof. So that was That's an end, end of a end of a range session there that I was not looking to end so quickly. Yeah, I bet you were just thrilled after that happened. Yeah, thankfully a recoil spring is a lot less expensive than an op rod, uh, so it wasn't a huge deal. Uh, you know, we're talking about like twenty bucks versus a couple hundred potentially. Uh, so I wasn't too upset, but a little bummed out when it happened. It reminds me of a malfunction me and my dad had. We were all excited to try out his new three fifty seven in the backyard, right? Mm -hmm. And we're shooting the thing. And the deer flies are getting more and more aggressive. 
oh, we're gosh. swatting them away and trying to focus on the target until finally we realize the hornet spilled a big basketball sized nest right over the backyard shooting range. Oh my gosh. And right when we saw that, we each get stung like 150 times. Oh. And, and it was just because they were getting progressively more and more upset by the mm -hmm. 357 mag. Oof. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of hard to wedge that story into any methodical discussion of ammunition, but there you have it. No, it's, it's, it's cool. Board, it's got us. You know, that's the thing I love about this, right, is we can just kind of talk about our experiences and, you know, share share the cool stories and things like that. We uh, should have been firing 17 Hornet, now that I think about that it. That would have been more appropriate, wouldn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. 22B. Now, I mean, in terms of recoil, uh, both of these are essentially equivalent. Uh, if you want to talk numbers, technically the 308 is about two foot pounds less than the 30 6 but most shooters are not going to feel any difference between the two of those. Yeah. Yeah, I'd imagine they they weren't too concerned about making the lowest recoil rifle that they, they possibly could. I want to touch back on the 30 odd six mm -hmm. uh the M1 spec ammo. It seems like that's only ever loaded with FMJ bullets, which kinda kinda screws over the hunting crowd, doesn't it? It is, sadly, but honestly, a lot of states don't allow uh, for semi-automatic firearms for hunting, so it's it's less of an issue. Uh, you can always hand load your own soft points. Uh, just make sure you're looking at appropriate loads for M1 Grands, and most reloading manuals will have specific loads for them. Uh, they usually refer to it as like a 30 6 service rifle. Uh, that is a typical way. I believe in my spear manual, that's how they have it labeled. Uh, and so just make sure you follow those recipes. Don't go over book max and uh, you should be totally fine. Yeah. Don't be the Elmer Keith of 30 odd six. Yeah. It's not the time to experiment. <laughs> well, let the wildcatters do that and bend their own op rods. All right. <laughs> you ever seen those pictures of Elmer Keith's revolvers that he blew to smithereens? I, I have. And the dude was a maniac, but uh, hey, you know, a, the father of the modern Magnum, that's for sure. We should do a whole podcast about him someday. Dude, I'm totally down for it. I will talk with the powers that be and see if we can't make that happen. You doesn't feel like something will fight us too hard on, but you nah. never know. Yeah, you never know. But still, uh, you know, quite the American uh, bringing us the 357 mag, amongst others, to say the least. Now, I will say there, there is quite a bit of scholarly debate, let's put it that way, about the accuracy differences between the 30 6 and the 308. But... I'm going to be honest, I'm going to go out there and just say that there really isn't any difference. It's mostly going to be the shooter more than the bullet itself. If you were using a microscope to split hairs, yeah, would you might... argue one is a little more accurate than the other? I suppose if we are going to split hairs and we do have the microscope on hand, uh, which sadly I, I left outside of my reach here uh, for our recording today. But uh, yeah, I suppose you could split hairs and maybe get it in there. And if I had to wager a guess, I'm going to say that probably the 308 is going to be a hair more accurate uh, because it is going to be a little bit tighter lockup uh, with the with the shoulders and the shorter cartridge as opposed to the longer uh, and the long action uh, 30-06. But practically, uh, for one, any game animal is not going to come over to you and be like, hey, you're, uh, you know, you're about a quarter of an inch off there. Uh, and <laughs> like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Pretty much. Yeah, situation. it's never going to happen. Uh, both of these are going to be more accurate than probably most of our listeners can shoot. And that's not a knock against any of our listeners because I know we've got some pretty accurate shooters here. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we got to get down to the, uh, to the final thing here. Absolutely. You, if you have to get one or the other, you're stuck on a desert island, you can only bring one of these guns. It feels like the 308 is just a smarter decision. I think the Desert Island is a stupid analogy, but uh, you're, you're just going to uh, find more more ammo for it. As, as popular as the 30 6 is, nothing compares to the 308. I, ha I have to agree with you on that, and uh, I know that I feel like a broken record sometimes talking about this when we've been comparing 308 to everything else. and. I, yeah. I think it really just comes down to that ammo availability and the fact that it's not as expensive. Uh, I think that's a huge thing, especially if you're going to like say, okay, I'm going to buy one rifle that I want to be able to hunt everything with or for, you know, relatively speaking, we ain't going 
Kodiak bear hunting with a 308 or a 30 out six, to be honest with you. Uh, you could, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a 308 is going to take down an elk. It can take down a caribou, a deer, and anything smaller. Uh, the 30 out six can do it too. It just may have a little bit more kinetic energy to it, but I don't know if it's worth the weight difference. Hmm. And just having a little more trouble finding exactly what you need. Oh, absolutely. I, I think the, the the varieties of 308 ammo that are out there uh, pretty much surpass 30 out 6, not by much, uh, because both of them are still incredibly popular. Uh, and, you know, the people who love their 30 out 6 are going to, you know, be, I've got my flame suit on. I'm ready for the comments, guys. Uh, but, I mean, theoretically, you need a Kevlar jacket. Probably, probably. And some rifle plates. I'll get the rifle plates from upstairs. We'll be fine. Uh, but, you know, it's it's one of those things, the 308 still in service with the military, and it's incredibly popular in the shooting community. And you know, if you want to gauge it by, you know, competitive shooting, you're not going to see a 30-06 on the thousand yard line. Uh, you'll be seeing the 308s, 300 Win Mags, and even the 6.5 Creedmoors now. So, yeah, my opinion, go with the 308. You can't go wrong. But, hey, if you've got your grandfather's old 30 out 6 you don't need to go out and sell it. Uh, there's there's definitely something to carrying uh, that older cartridge out there. There's a nostalgia to it. And if you just love the ping of that M1 Garand clip coming out, then, by golly, never sell that stuff because it is a piece of history and you will never regret going out to the range with that bad boy. Well put. Well said. I can hear you dog shifting around. That might mean it's time to. Probably time to call it a night here. Uh, and so I really appreciate everybody. Uh, make sure, again, you click that like and subscribe button and click the link down below to get your free $20 coupon. And make sure you also come back. We've got more comparisons coming up that I know you guys are going to absolutely love. Thank you, everybody. And we'll catch you on the next one. Yeah.